Okay, so um, I'll continue now. So as mentioned, uh, today we are talking about the Solarix PLI from Steka. Um, this is the, uh, the 48 volt version, um, the uh, PLI 5048. It is an uh, all-in-one device, so it means that you have an inverter. Um, so to convert DC to AC, you have a charger from the grid. So you can uh, use an AC source such as a generator or the grid to charge your battery. And also you have a direct connection to PV modules uh, because we have an integrated uh, solar charge controller with MPPT. So you can see here um, some of the, uh, the basic data. Uh, the uh, PLI 5048 is a five kilowatt model. That's why it says 5000. Um, it can uh, handle up to 10 kilowatts for five seconds. Um, so this is especially for bigger loads such as pumps or motors and things like that, compressors. We have, as mentioned, an integrated uh, solar charge controller with 80 amps. Uh, the maximum uh, open circuit voltage of the PV module that you connect there is 145 volts. So typically this will mean if you're using 60 cell crystalline uh, PV modules that you connect three in series and then you can make multiple strings. You'll see towards the end of the session, uh, I have uh, a couple examples for you on how to select the, the optimal stringing of your PV modules for uh, these particular Solarix PLI models. Then we also have a 60 amp, so a 60 amp on the battery side. Uh, charger from an AC source. Uh, so this could be, like I said, a, a grid or a generator, a diesel or a gasoline generator. Uh, you could also theoretically use a fuel cell, for example. And uh, because we have all, this, all of this functionality in a single package, it means that uh, pretty much the only thing you need during the installation uh, in terms of additional equipment is a fuse between uh, the PLI and the battery. And uh, we strongly recommend a surge protector on between the PV modules and the PV input of the PLI. If you have a, quite an unstable grid uh, or a grid where you have uh, peaks from time to time, uh, maybe through lightning or through general instability, uh, we also recommend a surge protector on the AC input side. Of course, if you're not using an AC source, if you're in a real off-grid location and you have no generator, then there's no need to put a uh, surge protector on the AC input. So some other properties of the PLI are that it's uh, usable um, either off-grid or on-grid. Uh, it means that, like I said, you can use uh, the grid to charge your battery optionally. Uh, you can also pass the grid directly to your loads. Uh, you cannot mix the two, uh, so you cannot mix, uh, you cannot, for example, take one kilowatt uh, out of your battery and two kilowatts from the grid at the same time. Uh, this is an either or device. Uh, it means that it can switch back and forth within 10 milliseconds, so very quickly. Uh, you, uh, to this date, we have not found uh, a load that is not capable of handling 10 milliseconds. Um, so it's uh, very quick to switch over. Um, an advantage that we cannot mix is actually that we are never working parallel to the grid. So in very many countries uh, nowadays, uh, you need a lot of certification if you ever work parallel to the grid. So if you mix uh, PV energy and grid energy at the same time, uh, then you need to fulfill many uh, different grid injection, et cetera, requirements. Uh, this device cannot do that. Like I said, it can only act as a pure load because it's charging the battery optionally or because it's passing uh, the grid energy directly to your loads, or it's completely disconnected from the grid. Both uh, the neutral and the live wire, N and L, are completely disconnected from the grid when uh, the inverter is running in off-grid mode. So it means it's absolutely impossible to inject into the grid with the PLI. Um, it also means that, for example, we do not have uh, any peaks going towards the grid. Um, you may know uh, in a grid parallel system that uh, if you have a, a large load which you turn off, then for a short amount of time, usually several milliseconds, sometimes even several seconds, um, the inverter is actually injecting into the grid, which is illegal in many countries. So this cannot happen here. Uh, then we have a, a relay on the bottom. 
uh, a switch uh, so you can start a generator automatically when energy is required. Then we have the uh, possibility to select a priority. So you can either prioritize PV or you can prioritize your AC input, which could be a grid or a generator. Like I said, the switching time is very fast. We have 10 milliseconds. And um, we also have an overload bypass, which you can select. This is optional. Uh, basically what that means is if you reach the, uh, the maximum limit of the inverter, so in this case it's five kilowatts, then either the inverter can try to handle the overload, uh, because like I said, we can handle 10 kilowatts for five seconds, or uh, it can automatically switch over to the AC source. So if, for example, if you're working with a grid, uh, then and if it, ever you have a peak above five kilowatts, then the inverter will simply switch to the grid, deliver uh, the energy completely from the grid during that peak time. So whenever you're using more than five kilowatts, and with a certain hysteresis, of course, so it doesn't switch back and forth too often. Um, after a certain time, if you drop below five kilowatts, it will then go back into off-grid mode if your battery voltage is sufficient and PV is working. So that's what the overload bypass does. Uh, this entire device weighs 11.5 kilograms, so it's uh, quite light uh, for the performance. Um, the primary reason is because we are working with a transformer, but it's a high-frequency transformer. So this is very fresh now. Uh, we've just added the 24-volt uh, the model to our portfolio. We will be presenting it next week at the Intersolar in Munich, uh, which is on uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, if you're coming. Um, so this is uh, exactly the same topology, so the functionality is identical uh, between uh, the 5048 uh, um, version I just showed you and this 2400-24-volt uh, version. So the, the main difference is, uh, as you can already see in the name, before we had 5000, so the 5000 can do 5 kilowatts, this one can do 2.4 kilowatts, and it's designed for a battery voltage of 24 volts nominal. So the rest is very similar. Like I said, uh, here the inverter can deliver 2.4 kilowatts or a 3.0 uh, kVA, and it can deliver twice that for five seconds, much like the uh, five kilowatt model. The uh, solar charge controller is smaller here. We have a 40 amp MPPT charge controller with a maximum voltage of 100 volt open circuit. So this typically means that you connect two 60-cell crystalline modules in series, and then you can make multiple strings. Again, um, I'll have some examples for you at the end of the session. We have the same charging capacity from the grid in amps. So uh, of course, because we have a lower battery voltage, it means we, we can deliver half the power as for the bigger one. But again, here we have a 60-amp charger from an AC source. And all the rest is pretty much the same, of course, except for the weight, uh, because we have a smaller device, it weighs 7.6 kilograms. So here are some, uh, some examples of uh, what you can do with these uh, Solar X PLI. Uh, the first example here is a pure off-grid system. So in this example, we have absolutely no AC source. We do not have a generator, we do not have a grid. So basically the AC input of the device is left unconnected and we are only connecting the battery. So this device only works with a battery, so you absolutely must have the battery. And we're connecting PV modules as an energy source. So this is a, for a pure off-grid system, as I said. And then on the AC output, we connect our 230 volt AC loads. So here the only energy source is PV. So obviously um, any priorities will not make any difference here because we do not have an AC source. Then in contrast to the off-grid system, we have a pure, uh, let's call it a pure grid system. It's actually working as an uninterruptible power supply. So basically as a UPS. So here again, we connect the battery and uh, we connect the loads just as we had before except this time we have nothing connected to the PV input, but instead we are connecting the public grid to the AC input. So like this, we can use the Solarix PLI as a UPS to secure your loads at home, your computers, maybe in a hospital as an emergency backup, 
Um, so there's no requirement for you to connect the PV modules. You can also use the device as a pure, uninterruptible power supply. So whenever there is a power outage, like I said, we have a very fast switch over time of 10 milliseconds. And then finally, we can also do both. So again, we can connect our AC loads and our batteries. This is always the same. And then we can connect PV modules as well. And in addition to that, a public grid or a diesel generator, or we can actually do both. But in that case, we need to have an external component, a source selector, because we can only handle one AC source at a time. We only have a single AC input. So these two may never touch. They may, ne may never um, be connected together at the same time. We need to have a source selector with a zero crossing. But like this, you can actually uh, use two different AC loads uh, sorry, two different AC sources, uh, an AC load, and then PV modules as well. Uh, there's actually one more example, which I don't have in here. Uh, if for some reason you do not need the inverter, you can even use it as a pure charge controller as well. There's no need for you to uh, connect anything to the AC output. You can just leave the AC output off. There's actually a switch for that. And then the device will work as a simple charge controller. So it will simply use the PV modules to charge up your battery. So maybe, for example, if you have a weekend home, for example, you can have the inverter running during the weekend when you're there. And whenever you're not there, you just switch off the inverter, but the charge controller is still running as soon as there's sun. And like that, your batteries are always kept topped up during the week until you come back during the weekend. So here you get an impression of uh, what we show on the display of the Solarix PLI. On the left-hand side here, I've uh, given you a list of all the different uh, values that are shown to you in real time. So they're updated uh, roughly every second. So we have the AC input and output voltage. This is your default view when you first uh, turn on the Solarix PLI. We also have the AC input and output frequency. Um, maybe a small word to that. Um, you may be asking yourself how we can achieve such a, a quick switchover. Uh, the reason is that as soon as we are connected to an AC input, so like I said, a grid or a generator, the Solarix PLI automatically synchronizes its uh, inverter frequency to that AC source. So um, if you have, let's say, a 52 hertz source, um, then even if you're working in off-grid mode, the uh, Solarix PLI will automatically adjust to that frequency to 52 hertz and will be in exactly the same rhythm as the grid so that we can very quickly switch over if ever need be. So for example, if, uh, if you're overloading the inverter and you have the bypass overload activated uh, and you surpass, let's say, 5 kilowatts for the 5 kV, uh, kilowatt model, then uh, we need to be able to react very quickly if you have a big load. So that's why we synchronize as soon as an AC source is present so that when we need to switch over, we can do so extremely quickly. Of course, if the grid frequency is extremely low or very high, so let's say before, be below, I think it's 40 or 45 hertz, it's in the data sheet, um, or above 65 hertz, then we will simply ignore the grid. We will work in off-grid mode because uh, we assume that your loads are not able to handle such a, a great swing in frequency. But as soon as the frequency is in the window, we will synchronize the grid, and like that, we can switch over very quickly. The third value we show is the uh, PV voltage of your PV modules. Then we have the charging and discharging current toward the battery, the charging power. So you will also see in watts how much energy is coming from your PV modules, uh, the battery voltage, of course. You can also see on the right of the display here, you see a scale with a percentage from 25 to 100. Um, this shows to you uh, very quickly and visually how much of the inverter capacity you're using. So if you're using the five kilowatt model, then 100% means five kilowatts. Um, so if you have uh, two bars here, for example, that's about half. So it means that you're using about 2.5 kilowatts from the inverter. Um, of course, you also see the value, how many watts you're actually using, and you also see um, the volt amps. So you can see the difference for uh, any loads which uh, have a power factor which is not equal to one. Then we have a uh, state of charge approximation uh, with these bars. 
um, they are referenced towards voltages on the battery. And then we also have the charging status to indicate with these arrows and these lines which way the energy is flowing at any one time. Then we also have a settings menu. Uh, we have about um, 35, 40 parameters, which you can uh, set in the inverter. And uh, warning and fault codes as well. There's also uh, three LEDs, which will show you the uh, charging state, the PV state, uh, and also if there is an error or not, so you can immediately see that. Um, you can also mute uh, the alarm. So you can give an alarm, for example, if your primary energy source is missing or if you go through the menu, you have beeps. So you can deactivate that if you want to have a, uh, a more silent device. And uh, here I'd like to show you some, uh, some typical screens you will see uh, during the operation. So obviously on the top right, you see all the elements we can show on the screen. And on the bottom here, you can see some, uh, some examples of what this would look like in real life. So in this case, in the bottom middle, you can see the PV charging is activated and the inverter is also on. So the energy flow is from the PV module on the left to the charge controller, which is here. And then part of the energy is directly sent to the loads through the inverter. And if you have excess energy, then the rest goes into the battery. Um, the same works, of course, if you're uh, consuming, let's say, two kilowatts, but you only have one kilowatt of PV, then, of course, the missing kilowatt will come out of the battery at the same time. And uh, in the right bottom, you see an example of what this would look like when you are charging from the grid, and you're also deliver delivering energy to your loads from the grid. So it's what we call the bypass mode. So this sine wave here on the left in the circle is showing uh, that we have a valid AC source, so this could be a generator or a grid. Um, we can see the top path here is going directly to the load. So it means that we are supplying our load directly from the AC source. And on top of that, we're taking some energy and charging the battery at the same time. So this is not necessary. You can also deactivate charging from the grid completely. And like that, you can simply wait for PV to come back to recharge the battery later. So I'd like to explain the, uh, the energy source priorities that you have um, available with a Solaris PLI. On the left-hand side, we can see the SBU mode. It's called Solar Battery Utility because the first priority is solar. So we will always try to use as much PV energy as we can because, of course, once the system is set up, the PV energy is typically the cheapest source. Then we have battery as the second priority. And if there is no PV and the battery voltage is below a level which you can set, then automatically the inverter will switch over to the AC input, which could be, for example, a utility, a grid, or a generator. So this is quite simple. First priority, PV. Second priority, if PV is not enough, then the rest will come out of the battery. And if the battery is empty or it's up to you what you define as empty. You can also say that, for example, when the battery is 80% uh, full, you already switched to grid. Um, then the third priority is switching to the AC input source. So this first use case is if you want to uh, save as much money as you can. So let's say, for example, uh, you've installed this with a PV connection and on the AC input you have a grid. Of course, you're paying typically for your energy per kilowatt hour. So this first use case is if you want to save energy by using as much PV as you can. Then we have uh, the second use case, which is the AC input as the first priority. So here, priority number one, as soon as the AC input is present and valid, so if the frequency is within the allowed range and the voltage is, is within the allowed range, then we will use the AC input as our primary energy source. So this is particularly interesting if you want to supply your loads at any cost. Uh, let's say you have a hospital or something, then you want to make sure your battery is always as full as possible because if the grid fails, then you want to have as much reserve as you possibly can in your battery so that you can, you can spend as much time as possible uh, with the grid missing to, uh, to get over your blackout situation. So the first uh, 
source is the AC input, that's your primary energy source, and the second, the secondary energy source is battery and PV. So if the grid fails or if your AC input fails, uh, then it will automatically use PV and battery energy. So the use case uh, I've already mentioned is if you want to supply power to your loads uh, no matter what happens. So this is a classical uninterruptible power supply with, of course, the added benefit that you can add PV so that you can, especially during the day, if you have a power outage, you can uh, sometimes go uh, for, for days or for hours at least where with a classical uninterruptible power supply, you can basically only discharge your battery. And if the grid doesn't come back, well, then you're basically in a blackout. So here you can support your battery by PV. And then we have the, uh, the third uh, energy source priority. And I think this is the, uh, uh, the only one that requires a bit more explanation. It's actually, um, if you look through the manual, it looks very similar to the first solar battery utility priority. But there's one important difference. Uh, this one is called solar first because basically you will only be working in off-grid mode if PV energy is available. So let me explain. Priority number one is PV. So if PV is available, we will try to supply our loads with PV. If the PV power is not sufficient, so if you're producing less energy from your PV modules than your loads are requiring, uh, then the remainder of the energy is taken out of the battery. Again, you can set a limit how much you will allow the battery to discharge for this. And then, so this, these first two points are pretty much exactly the same as, uh, as the SBU mode. The third point is where it changes a little bit. Before, uh, basically, if PV was not sufficient, uh, you would simply discharge your battery. Here, if, if you have absolutely no PV, so for example, at night, it will automatically immediately switch to the AC input. So it will not discharge your battery to the voltage that you've set. As soon as there's no PV, it will automatically switch to grid. Why would you want to do that? Well, um, in a scenario which is similar to the first one, so you want to reduce your power bill, you want to use uh, PV power, but you also want to protect your batteries because maybe you're using less lead acid batteries. Um, and in this case, you can avoid uh, discharging the batteries too much. So you will only use the battery during the day as a buffer because, of course, there might be clouds. You might be producing a little bit less energy than you require. But you can be certain that you're not uh, discharging your battery with your loads during the night. So that's the difference between the third and the four first priority here. So this is what the uh, Solaris PLI looks like uh, in the connection bay. Uh, for now, I only have a picture of the 5 kilowatt model. Um, I think uh, maybe uh, in a month or so, uh, I'll update the presentation to, uh, to include the, uh, the 24 volt model as well. Um, the connections are the same, but obviously uh, it looks a little bit different because it's smaller. Um, here we have the AC input. So this is where we connect our grid or our generator. Then we have the AC output. This is where we connect our AC loads. Here we have an input breaker. Um, this is to protect the inverter from, um, from too high current on your loads when it's connected to the grid and when it's in bypass mode. So let's say you're in off-grid mode, so you're not connected to the grid, either because the grid is not available or because uh, the grid is out of range, so the voltage is too high or too low or the, the frequency is too high or too low, then um, your energy will come out of the battery and out of PV. So in this case, uh, if you go above five kilowatts, uh, like I said, we can handle 10 kilowatts for about, about five seconds. But beyond that, uh, at some point, the inverter has to protect itself, so it will turn off the loads. So that's uh, the protection. It will typically do that quicker than, than most breakers can do on the AC output. Um, so the question is, what will happen if you're in bypass mode? So if the grid is being fed right through to your loads, then um, even if the inverter stops, the energy would still keep flowing. So that's why we have this breaker here, which will simply pop out at 40 amps AC. So this is about equivalent at 230 volts to about 9.8 kilowatts. So that's the absolute maximum limit, even if you're connected to the grid, is uh, 40 amps on the AC side. Then we have a serial RS232 port. Uh, 
Uh, cable is also included uh, with the inverter. We also have a, a USB port, so both of these will provide you with the same data. Um, the RS-232 port uh, we will use later as well um, for uh, remote monitoring. It's something we don't have available yet, but it will come later, later uh, this year, in fall probably, uh, and that will be connected to the RS-232 port, for example. Then we have the dry contact, which is the relay signal that you can use, for example, to start up your generator if, uh, if you require energy because your battery is low. Then we have the on-off switch. Um, I've sort of mentioned that in the beginning. This is only valid for the actual inverter. So it's only inval valid for the, basically the AC output portion. If you switch the Solaris PLI off here, the charge controller will still function. So like I said, if you're in a weekend house, um, if you're gone during the week, you simply switch this off, but you can still be sure that the PV energy is being used to keep your batteries full all the time. Basically, as soon as the uh, PV voltage drops below the battery voltage, then the inverter will completely turn off. So the, the display will turn off, everything will turn off. And in the morning, when the sun comes up again, the, battery, the PV voltage rises again, the display will automatically turn on, the charge controller will activate, and your battery will be charged. But if this is off, the AC output will remain off. Then up here, you see that's the PV input. And then finally, here is the battery connection. Um, for the battery connection, we've included the, uh, the ring terminals that you, re you require in the package. Uh, the ring terminals, and this is the same for the 24 volt and the 48 volt model, um, they are compatible with cable cross section from 35 millimeter squared to 50 millimeter squared. Uh, I'm sorry, two questions have been asked by chat. Um, I'll answer them at the end of the session. So here we also have the uh, possibility if we uh, need more energy than what a single Solaris PLI can deliver, um, if we wish to uh, to go above 5 kilowatts for the 48 volt model or 2.4 kilowatts for the 24 volt model, then we can use uh, up to nine Solaris PLI together. Uh, they must be the same identical model, so of course we cannot mix 48 volt with 24 volt devices, but uh, we're very flexible in how we uh, configure those nine devices. So. We can connect up to nine devices. For the uh, five kilowatt model, that means nine times five kilowatts. Uh, it means uh, we have 45 kilowatts as a total maximum power. And for the smaller 24 volt version, we have 21.6 kilowatts as the maximum power. We can, uh, it's up to us, we can put all nine devices on a single phase, or we can divide them up into three phases. In order to do this, you need a parallel kit for each of the uh, connected Solarix PLI inverters. Um, if you order that kit, it comes with one uh, circuit board, which is pictured on the left here. Um, at the very left bottom, you see uh, an example for the 5048, so the, for the five kilowatt version. And just beside it, uh, there's a slight difference because there's actually um, a small metal plate um, on top of the, uh, the circuit board. So this is for the 24 volt version, the 2.4 kilowatt inverter. So you get either one of these uh, two cards and then you always get one communication cable and one current sharing cable. You need one kit for each connected inverter. So if you connect two inverters together, you need two kits. If you connect seven inverters together, you need seven kits. So this is what a parallel connection will look like. If we look on the right, we have the battery here. Um, all inverters must be connected to the same battery. So you cannot use different batteries for different inverters. Uh, simply an error would, uh, would come up. So they always need to be on the same battery. Then you have your battery fuse. Then you have your inverter. And then all inverters, because this is a parallel connection on a single phase, are sharing the same AC input and the same AC output. So they're simply connected in parallel on the AC output and on the AC input. Now, in order for these inverters to uh, communicate with each other, uh, to make sure that they're always synchronized, for example, um, I, I showed you in the previous uh, slide, there's a communication cable and a current sharing cable. 
So here you can see how they're connected. The green cables are the current sharing cables, and the orange cables are the communication cables. In the manual from the, uh, from the parallel kit, which you can find on our, on our website, we have every single possible um, configuration from one to nine inverters, or sorry, from two to nine inverters, because of course for a single one you don't need to have a communication, um, so that it's easy to find uh, the version that you need. So the job of these cables is the orange ones here, those are the communication cables. Uh, this is the cable uh, which exchanges digital information between the inverters. So uh, this is where the synchronization takes place between uh, the different inverters. The green cables are uh, an analog communication and they're simply used so that the inverters can uh, tell each other very quickly how much energy they're providing. Uh, this is to avoid um, any imbalance. So for example, let's say I'm, uh, I'm consuming six kilowatts, then these green cables make sure that each inverter is delivering exactly two kilowatts and so that not one inverter is delivering four and the other two are delivering one kilowatt. Um, I was just asked a question, which, uh, which fuse size? Um, these fuses here uh, toward the battery, uh, we recommend 250 amps. Uh, the reason is quite simple because if you take uh, 10 kilowatts uh, and you divide that by 90% uh, to get uh, pretty much the lowest efficiency that's possible um, so that we can, can account for any losses uh, even in the, in the very high power region, um, then we get roughly uh, 250 amps. So that's how the fuse is sized. You can take slightly less, you can take 200 amps or 180 amps, but then you need, to, you need to make sure that you have a very slow fuse because otherwise uh, what could happen is if you have a peak of 10 kilowatts, then your, your fuse might blow even though the inverter is actually theoretically capable of delivering 10 kilowatts for five seconds. So if you wanna be on the safe side, just use 250 amp DC uh, fuses on the battery. <clears throat> so here we have another example. Again, we have uh, three SolarX PLI. This time they're not connected in parallel, but they're connected as a three-phase configuration. So we have exactly the same PLIs. We have exactly the same parallel kits, one installed on each PLI. Uh, but now the difference is, you can already see here, for example, we don't have any green cables. We don't have any of these current sharing cables. We only have the communication cables. Uh, the reason is quite simple. Um, you only need the current sharing cables if you have more than one device per phase. So in this example, we have a single PLI on each phase, so we don't need any current sharing cables. We do still need the communication cables, of course, because the inverters need to be able to speak to each other so that we can have the phase shift between the phases, the 120 degree uh, angle between the phases. So the battery side is identical. All inverters must always be on the same battery connected via a fuse. And then on the AC input, we define the first device as phase one. This is all explained very clearly in the parallel kit manual. Uh, you need to define the phase for each device in the menu. So the device, which is phase one, will get phase one from the grid or from the generator if you have an AC source. Phase two will get phase two from the grid and phase three will get phase three from the grid. And exactly the same thing on the AC output. So you, can, you need to have at least one PLI per phase. So you cannot have, for example, a, a three-phase system with only two inverters, that will not work. Uh, so you need to have at least three inverters, one per phase. And uh, you can have up to seven inverters per phase in a three-phase system. Because remember, the total limit is nine pieces. So theoretically, you could have seven inverters on the first phase, one inverter on the second, and one inverter on the third phase. You can, you can have an asymmetrical, um, a system like that. So this is to clarify what larger systems will look like. This is a symmetrical three-phase system, so we have exactly three PLI inverters per phase, and each one of these three will work in parallel on that phase. And then we have uh, another example of an asymmetric system where, again, we have three phases. Like I said, we must have at least one inverter per phase, but we can have more than one inverter on some phases or on every phase. So in this case, we have three inverters on phase one, two inverters on phase two, and one on phase three. 
This is just for your reference. Um, we will send you the, uh, the PDF of this presentation uh, later per, by email. So um, I'm not going to go into too much detail here. Uh, suffice to say that uh, we have a zero crossing between the grid and the, uh, the off-grid modes, uh, you can see here. And uh, like this, it's impossible for the inverter to actually be connected to the grid. It's only acting as a charger when it's charging the battery when it's connected to the grid if you activate the charging. I was just asked um, a, uh, a 250 amp fuse uh, on a 50 uh, square millimeter cable. Uh, yes, like I said, it's, it's up to you. Obviously, um, you need to f uh, fulfill your local regulations. Uh, if that's too much, I think a, a fast 250 amp fuse should be legal. Um, if it's not legal, well then simply use a lower fuse and make sure that it's slow enough to provide the five seconds. Um, in practice, uh, what can happen if you use uh, less than 200 amps as a battery fuse, um, then like I said, what could happen is the fuse will, will burn before uh, the, the PLI can actually stop delivering power. So basically the PLI would be capable of delivering more power but the fuse will burn. So it's up to you and it's certainly up to your local regulations on how you size that fuse. But if you want uh, peace of mind and if it's legal in your country, like I said, we would recommend 250 amps. So let's look at some grounding. Um, there's some, uh, some PV module manufacturers which require either a positive or a negative grounding of the PV cables. Uh, this has to do with, uh, with some, uh, some mechanical, physical effects of the cells um, to make sure that there's no cell deterioration throughout the years. With most crystalline PV modules, this is not a requirement. Um, we do not have uh, uh, any uh, PID effect, uh, the potential induced degradation, which you will find uh, is, can be an issue in some grid-connected inverters uh, because of very high voltages. We're talking about voltages six, seven hundred volts or even a thousand volts. Uh, here, because we have only three PV module in series, and like I said, the maximum limit is 145 volts, this is virtually a PID-free system regardless of what PV modules you're using. So let's say that uh, your PV module manufacturer requires you to have a positive grounding on the PV modules. You can go ahead and do that. That's not an issue. So I'm going to go through every uh, possible option here that you can use for grounding. It doesn't mean you should do it. Um, normally, we recommend not to ground your PV modules. This is only if this is a requirement from your PV module manufacturer or possibly if it's some kind of a local uh, law or requirement in your country. So you can uh, go ahead and connect the, uh, the positive uh, PV cable. This is the next slide. Um, you could also connect not also, but uh, instead you could connect the negative PV cable as well to uh, ground if required by the PV manufacturer. And then if you need to ground your battery, you can go ahead and ground either your positive pole or your negative pole. Of course, not both at the same time because that would cause a short circuit. And now let's look at some combinations. If you um, ground the negative line of your PV module, you may, you don't have to, but you may also ground the negative pole of your battery. But there's obviously some uh, combinations which you cannot do. So here are the grounding types which are not allowed for the battery in PV. You may not ground a PV cable and the opposite polarity of the battery terminal. So you can't, for example, ground the positive PV cable and the negative of your battery. That would cause a big problem um, and vice versa. And you may not, not uh, ground the positive PV cable and the positive battery cable at the same time. So that's what you're not allowed to do. All the, the images I showed you are all configurations which you are permitted to, uh, to, to make. So now what about the uh, AC grounding and operator protection? Uh, in most countries uh, and obviously in areas where, where people are, are near the device or where the AC loads are used by people, so in, in non-industrial uh, grounds, it is, uh, it is always important to uh, take into account uh, the safety of humans. So in case uh, 
in case there's a malfunction of some kind to avoid electrical shock of, of people and dangerous situations. Uh, in general, the uh, protective earth uh, terminals of the uh, inverter, I'll go back and show you. So here we always had three terminals on the uh, AC input and the AC output. And the left one, this is the grounding terminal. So this is your protective earth. So this is uh, something you must do. You, you also see in these pictures here, I've always added the protective earth. This is a requirement. It says so in the manual as well for safety reasons um, to connect uh, the protective earth of the inverter to a good grounding terminal of your, of your home or of your installation. So this is a requirement. And uh, then in most cases, uh, you will have uh, some kind of a TNC grid or a TNS grid. Uh, so basically some kind of a, a grid system where uh, neutral and ground are separate. So this is the case in most countries. Uh, pretty much in every country where you're using a so-called residual current device, an RCD, uh, will typically have some kind of a uh, a grid type which uh, which has a separate neutral and a separate ground. So in this case, uh, what would happen if you, uh, I'll, I'll show it to you actually on the next slide. This is what it typically looks like. You have um, a neutral and uh, a live line from your, from your grid. Sometimes you also have a ground from the grid. Sometimes you need to make your own ground at the site. And then the two need to be split apart. So basically before you go into your distribution box or in your distribution box, uh, you need to make sure that your neutral and your ground line are apart. And then anytime later in the distribution box, you can go ahead and put in a residual current device, which will basically measure the current going in both directions. And as soon as there's a difference of more than a set value, typically 30 milliamps, which is uh, considered the, the safe limit for humans, then the RCD will simply open and will disconnect all of your, 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 both your live wire and your neutral wire. So this is for protecting people from electric shock. The problem is if we're working in off-grid mode, then like I said, both neutral and line are disconnected from the grid. Uh, what that means is even if you have a residual current device on the AC output, it would not work because there would be no current flowing towards ground. So you would not be able to detect a defect on this side. So it means that uh, you could get into a dangerous situation. So in order to avoid that, what we do is whenever we're in off-grid mode, we automatically connect neutral and ground together. And this is to ensure that the RCD will always work, regardless of whether you're in grid mode or in off-grid mode. You can also see that in the, in the topology diagram. It's up here. This is the grid relay. So you can see it's simple open close for the phase, for the L. And for the neutral, there's one position where we're connected to the grid, and there's one position where we're connected to ground. And this relay is always in one of the two positions. So it means that in off-grid mode, neutral and ground are always connected together. And this will simply mean that you can use your traditional residual current device uh, the way you would in a standard home installation in most countries and it will simply save you money because RCDs are, are quite cheap. Um, if we did not have that, you would need to use um, what's called an isolation, um, I'm not sure what the name is exactly, it's Isolationswächter in, in German. Um, and basically it's a device which measures the, the resistance between ground and your neutral and your phase. And uh, this device simply costs uh, many times as much as an RCD and it's much more difficult to source as well. An RCD you will find in pretty much every hardware store. So this gives you a possibility to have uh, re reliable and comparatively cheap uh, protection for human safety the way you're used to. So now let's look at uh, some uh, PV sizing. Um, we'll look, uh, we need to uh, split up between the uh, 5 kilowatt 48 volt version and the 2.4 kilowatt 24 volt version because of course we have uh, different charge controllers so we also have different configurations. So here we'll look at the, uh, the 5 kilowatt model 48 volt version first. So this is the information that we need from your PV modules when we're sizing uh, a system like this. We need to know your 
total power in watt peak and we need to know your voltages. So you need to know the MPP voltage of your PV modules and your open circuit voltage of your PV modules. Traditionally, this is written in pretty much every data sheet from pretty much every manufacturer of PV modules. You'll see here as well, current is not relevant. Uh, and for a standard um, sizing, you do not need to regard the current because if the voltage is correct and the power is correct, the current must be correct. So there's no need to, uh, to look at the current in detail. So, if we want to size the uh, PV modules, the first step is to look at the minimum required PV voltage. So, for the 5K model, uh, for the 5048, the minimum PV voltage is 48 volts MPP. So, you should string your PV modules so that uh, they provide a total of at least 68 volts MPP, even when it's warm, because, of course, we have a, uh, a temperature curve for PV modules, typically crystalline PV modules will provide less voltage when it's warm and more voltage when it's cold, so you need to take that into account for your site. So this is your minimum voltage is 68 volts for the, uh, for the 48 volt version and half that, 34 volts for the 24 volt version of the Solaris PLI. So we know our minimum, so let's look at the maximum now. The maximum I mentioned earlier is 145 volts open circuit for the PLI 5048 and 100 volts for the PLI 2424. Um, I'm just being asked whether I can send this. Yes, uh, like I said, uh, we will send you the PDF by email uh, in a couple days of this uh, entire presentation. So these are the maximum voltages. So we had a minimum of 68 volts for the five kilowatt model, and now we know the maximum is 145 volts. So we need to make sure that our PV installation will always stay between these limits. Obviously at night, we cannot stay above the minimum, that's clear. But during the day, we need to make sure that uh, we're between these limits so that we can uh, use the, uh, the system to its full potential. And especially for the higher voltage, make sure that you never reach that voltage, um, even when it's cold, because like I said, Typically, under colder conditions, PV modules will have a higher voltage. So we know our minimum and we know our maximum. And now here are some basically standard rules, uh, which you can apply very quickly uh, to size this very quickly. So this will take about a minute on the phone uh, if you have a customer or something. If you're working with 36 cell crystalline PV modules, uh, then you can connect or you should connect five modules in series per string on the five kilowatt version, 48 volts. And then you build multiple strings in parallel. For the 24 volt version, it's three PV modules. For the most popular PV modules, which are the 60 cell PV modules, I think worldwide it must be about 70% of the PV modules being sold are 60 cell modules. They tend to be the cheapest as well because they're used uh, typically in grid connected installations. So obviously that's one of the big advantages of using a, um, an MPPT charge controller is to be able to use the, the cheaper PV modules, which are for grid systems. So here you take three modules per, per, per string. So you put three modules in series for the 48 volt version and two modules in series for the 24 volt version. And then finally for the bigger PV modules with 72 cells, you use two for the 48 volt version and one for the 24 volt version of the PLI. But uh, we recommend not to use 72 cell uh, crystalline modules with the uh, 24 volt version PLI because you'll find that when it gets colder, um, you can have issues with temperature. So we would recommend uh, not to use that. Okay, so this is a, a, a practical uh, example. I've uh, chosen some data from a typical 60 cell PV modules. I don't remember which one it is, but they're all within about a one or two volts of each other. Um, so this is a 250 watt peak. So this is pretty much as standard as it gets. I think nowadays maybe it's more like 255, 260 is like the standard because obviously we're getting more power each year. But here uh, taken from the data sheets, we have a, an MPP voltage of 31.2 volts and an open circuit voltage of 37.6 volts. Um, I don't have uh, so much time now, but um, you'll easily find that if you take four of these PV modules in series, you will be fine 
when it's warmer, but you will reach uh, the limit of the, uh, of the PLI when it gets colder, certainly below zero. So uh, we cannot advise that. And you'll also find that if you take only two mo modules instead of four, that you're actually below the minimum voltage for a lot of the time. So both of those options are no good. So that's why the typical uh, configuration is three PV modules in series for 60 cell modules. And then you can put up to above about seven strings in parallel. So the maximum actually usable power of the, uh, of the MPPT charge controller, which is integrated in here, is 4.8 kilowatts. Um, the reason it's 4.8 kilowatts is it's actually uh, 60 volts, um, which is the, uh, the maximum voltage of the battery times 80 amps, which is the maximum power of the MPP charge controller. That's how we reach 4.8 kilowatts. So that's the maximum usable power you can use. So in this configuration, I've written it up here, we actually have 5.25 kilowatt peak. If you count together uh, 250 watt peaks times, uh, what is it, 21 PV modules, uh, you'll actually find we have more than 4.8 kilowatts. But that's okay because it just means we can only use 4.8 kilowatts under perfect conditions. But, you know, when it's uh, a little bit rainy outside or, or diffuse light or morning, evening, et cetera, uh, there's no way we're going to be reaching the, the maximum uh, power of our PV modules. So this is our upper limit. We recommend a maximum of 20% of overdimensioning. So you should have no more than 20% more than the 4.8 kilowatts in PV power. But 10, 15, 20% more is no problem. So that's what we have here. There's also one more uh, important note. If you're connecting more than two strings in parallel, and I think this is, uh, might be news for those of you that are working typically with grid connected inverters, where you typically only have one or two strings, uh, then you need to uh, connect string fuses as well. So you can either use fuses or diodes, um, but uh, you need to connect them because what can happen if for some reason this PV module becomes defective, and this string has a much lower voltage than the others. Then instead of the energy flowing towards the charge controller, the energy will flow into the defective module. And this means that we can have a lot of current traveling into a defective module, which can cause uh, very high temperatures or, or even smoldering. And that's why uh, typically uh, this value is given on your PV modules, it's typically about 20 amps. Um, that's the maximum current that the PV modules can survive. So you need to make sure that you put fuses in each one of these points to make sure that you never have such a high reverse current. This reverse current will only happen if you completely cover a PV module, not when it's in the shade, but I mean completely covered as in uh, literally putting cardboard piece across it or something like that. Even if you have some leaves over it a little bit, uh, that won't be an issue. If it's an east-west roof, that's not an issue. That's not a complete covering. It just means that you have diffuse light on that PV module. So only if there's really an error or a complete covering of this PV module does this string fuse need to do its job or the string diode. This is the uh, equivalent for the 24 volt version. So for the Solarix PLI uh, 2424, I'm using exactly the same uh, PV module data. Uh, here the maximum power is 1.168 kilowatts. Uh, the max, because the maximum battery voltage is 29.2, again, times the current, which is uh, 40 amps for this MPVT charge controller. That's the maximum current. So that means we have roughly a little bit less than 1.2 uh, kilowatts that we can actually use. So in this example, we have 1.5 kilowatts. Again, we are slightly overdimensioning, but not too much. Again, you can do up to 20% above this. And again, because we have more than two strings in parallel, we should be um, integrating uh, string fuses or string diodes. So now for the final slide. Um, I'm about one minute over time, so I think uh, uh, that, that's okay for you. Um, some further con uh, considerations, uh, if you wanna have a, a well working system, uh, one is the battery size. Basically, uh, this is our recommendation. You take the AC power times five hours. So, for example, 5,000 watts times five hours. You divide that by the battery voltage. 
so 48 volts, for example, for the 5 kilowatt model, and that will give you your capacity in amp hours. That's our recommendation for your battery capacity. We completely understand that um, most people will try to use less than that simply because obviously the batteries are typically the by far most expensive component of your system. So people are always trying to press uh, um, to reduce the battery capacity. So the absolute minimum uh, for lead batteries that we can recommend is 200 amp hours. This is the absolute minimum. Um, below that, we cannot guarantee uh, full functionality of the Solarix PLI. Um, you'll also find that if you go below that, you will exceed the maximum rating of your battery in, in the vast majority of cases because you will, if you're discharging with 5 kilowatts and you have a 100 amp hour battery, then that current is actually much too high for such a small battery. So that's our recommendation is this, and the minimum, and the minimum is also stated in the manual is 200 amp hours. The same goes for the 24 volt version. It's 24 volt, 200 amp hours is the minimum for the 24 volt version of the Solarix PLI. So that's regarding the battery size. Then surge protectors. Um, a surge protector, also known as an SPD, a surge protective uh, device, I think it is, <laughs> excuse me. Um, is uh, strongly recommended as a PV input. For the uh, 5048, we recommend this model or something equivalent. Uh, we have no affiliation with CTEL, it's just uh, a model I found which, uh, which fits quite well. Um, if you're looking for your own model, make sure that the clamping voltage is lower than 160 volts. So your surge protector needs to be able to short circuit above 160 volts to prevent uh, anything above 160 volts from reaching the charge controller. Um, if you install an SPD, which you're using, for example, for grid inverters, which will clamp at 1,000 volts, it's absolutely no good because the inverter will be, uh, or the charge controller will be damaged much before 1,000 volts are reached. So there's no point installing it. If you're going to install one, which we strongly recommend, then install the correct one. So this is the correct one. And also make sure that the maximum DC operating voltage, which is always given in the data sheet of the SPD, is higher than any PV voltage that you will reach in your system at any time of the year. So look at your colder winter months, uh, check the, the voltage, uh, sorry, the, uh, the temperature for those colder months, uh, multiply that with the temperature compensation of your PV module, and like that you get your real voltage, open circuit voltage in the winter and then you need to make sure that your SPD can operate with that voltage. For the 24 volt version of the PLI, um, the uh, clamping voltage must be lower than 110 volts. This is an example here I recommend from CTEL again. Um, and again, same story, the maximum DC operating voltage uh, indicated by your SPD must be higher than the real voltage of your PV modules under cold conditions. And this goes with any electronics keep the device uh, as cool as possible. Um, it will simply perform uh, better uh, than if it's sitting in the sun. Um, if the MPPT charge controller will not go into derating. Um, so this is just a, an obviously, obvious, I think, general rule for any electronics. 